Hey, I'm Mike Myers, and this is the Songwriting for Guitar podcast, which is geared to support songwriters and producers to gain confidence and turn pro. I bring on industry experts to help you improve and monetize your skills, engage better in the writing process, and build healthy habits to create a sustainable career that you love. Caffeinated, inspirational, conversational. Hey, what's up, friends? Mike Myers here with the Songwriting for Guitar podcast, episode 101 with John Lund. It's very clear sometimes where I geek out about episodes when I have a guest on and I'm so excited to dive into it because I'm a fan of their work. And that's pretty much every episode. That's what's a great thing about having a podcast. But this one especially, John Lund is a phenomenal composer. Things that he's done like Shetland, The Last Kingdom, a little show from Netflix, or the show called Downton Abbey. John is a phenomenal composer with a, an extensive background, not just in classical, but pop. And we dive into his entire process. How does he write to picture? How does he know what works for a scene? What is his process? And I'm so glad to have him on. He was so gracious enough with his time to speak to our Insiders Track Sync membership a while back that I was thrilled to have him back, dive deeper into the process. And so that's what this episode is all about. If you are someone that's trying to understand this world of composing and understand this world of TV and film, this is an episode you don't want to miss, and we get into it. So I'm not going to yammer on anymore. We're going to dive into it. Episode 101, John Lund. John, I really appreciate you taking the time for this. Well, it's my pleasure, Mike. Nice to be with you all again. I was really excited because you you spoke to my class a while back, and I just wanted to go into a deep dive conversation with you because I felt like there was so much more I wanted to cover and also just geek out over <laughs> with you. And what better way on a podcast format? And you know, even if people don't know who you are, they've heard your music. That's what I think is amazing about composing is like, they may be like, I'm not sure who you are, but immediately you say something like, oh, I, I think you said you'll take Downton Abbey to your grave. That's the thing that people will be like. I'll be on my gravestone, you know, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, things like that. But also most recently, I think, it, you know, with its success, Last Kingdom, which those two are just polar opposites to me. Yeah, which was the attraction for me because I was becoming known for Downton Abbey and actually I quite, you know, well, as you can see from behind me, I do quite like working with electronics as well. So Downton Abbey was a little bit of a, I wouldn't say it was an offshoot because I've always, I've always done orchestral stuff as well. But, um, you know, I was becoming known for that kind of sound, you know, that, and I was getting a little bit typecast. So when The Last Kingdom came along... I was really, I was really keen to do it because I knew it would be radically different, you know. And um, yeah, I mean, you can't, they could, they couldn't be further apart. I mean, especially because Last Kingdom, that's like ninth century area, so it's just yeah. like, what is this? The, you have kind of this, I feel like this uh, leeway to be like, I can kind of create the sound that I want. Well, you can, but well, you you've got complete freedom because I mean, well, a you know, our knowledge of what the music was like in the 9th century is pretty crude. And, you know, it's unlikely to be <laughs> it's unlikely to be anything else other than what we think. And, you yeah. know, and that's not really the role of film music. You know, film film music is an, is, is an artificial genre that grew 100 years ago. Yeah. Basically. And the early, you know, forms of film music were like quite in the 19th century classical music, you know, and kind of over, you know, over romanticized and 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 over dramatic in many ways, you know. And we've we've kind of moved on quite a lot from that. A lot of what I do, I think, is about signaling what's going on inside people's heads in a movie, you know, the, the things that people don't say or but they're thinking. Um, and that certainly there was a lot, quite a lot of that going on in the Last Kingdom. And there's a lot of that going on in Downton Abbey as well. Um, and, and less, you know, about tunes and, 
you know, taking you from A to B, and it's kind of all, you know, it's setting up and and in, certainly in the Last Kingdom, there was the setting up a kind of atmos, kind of constant atmosphere of dread mm-hmm. a lot of the time because it was, yeah. you know, people didn't live for very long, you know, it was <laughs> brutal, you know, in many yeah. ways, you know, and and then and then there are these kind of extreme moments of love and happiness, you know, that, that, yeah. that and and so. So I really concentrated on two, those two extremes. And if you think about it, the music does move from those kind of, you know, beauty to kind of really raw, kind of quite ugly. And we use a lot of noise. That's what I think is interesting. You went very synth-based. Yeah. Uh, where... Uh, I think uh, if you look at something like I, I still love the show, like Viking, like a lot yeah. of those other shows that popped up, very orchestral, hybrid orchestral kind of like realm. You chose let's kind of not go into that, but let's let's do beds of sound. Almost what you said, because there's this these tensions and release where it's a moment yeah. of like they're they're secretly they have a romantic moment and the next minute you've got a massive battle where thousands are being killed yeah so instead of doing it with kind of like 19th century harmony the tension between that it uses a lot of noise and then um, there's a lot of detuning going on as well and it's the tension's kind of created that way and also at the time when we were started out on the last kingdom there was a little bit of a worry about um Comparing it to Game of Thrones, although it's not remotely the same kind of show, because yeah, it's kind of based on on fact, you know, roughly, mm-hmm. and you know, there's no sort of magic elements, you know, and it's not fantasy. I I thought one well one way to not you know b- would be not to have that kind of sort of cod orchestral um kind of element to it, and actually do it you know with something you know much more. More, much braver in a way, actually, I think, and 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 the producers were. It was one of those jobs that just worked out quite well in that I was due to take a break anyway, and they were still filming the Last Kingdom, so I actually had I had a little bit of time, you know. They sent me some clips and stuff like that, which is unusual for me. Usually. I wait until the film's locked before I start working on it, you know, and it's been edited. But in The Last Kingdom, I actually started off quite early on it, you know, long before they'd locked the first episode, you know, and I had Ivor, the singer, on board as well before we'd locked, you know, I had, I had, um, I'd, I'd already brought her over from Copenhagen to London and we'd had three days recording and, and I knew then that, you know, that we were going to be doing it together the mixture of your 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 sound beds that you create with her vocal it's almost like it just works so well that now creates this thing that it's a signature sound to the show yeah so that was so as i said you know we we decided not to go down the orchestral route and it was going to be all electronic but i mean that was easier said than done i mean there were you know because of these battles you know, and these come, you know, sort of epic, you know, moments, you know, and, you know, how the hell am I going to do those, you know, without, you know, just with electronics? And I thought, I, I, at one point, I managed to convince myself it was going to be possible. And then my agent played me a recording of Ivor on YouTube, and she was doing this throat singing, but kind of rhythmic and, you know, and kind yeah. of quite funky. And she was playing a drum as well. And I thought, ooh. Cool, oh, that's interesting. Um, and uh, so, you know, I, in fact, what happened was I nicked the bit of YouTube over and I put it over the end of the very first episode. And then I added like a distorted double bass to it and, yeah, and I, and a, like a synth pad, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and I sent it off to the producers and they absolutely loved it. So I thought. So I got in touch with her, um, and brought her over to London, and we recorded for three days, and and we did loads of different stuff. I mean, she did, I because I I really didn't know what to expect. I knew she did the, that rhythmic thing, and she was obviously a good singer, but but she was also she was really kind of trying to be a pop artist at this stage, 
you know, in 2015, 2016. So I really wasn't sure what she was, but, you know, I mean, she's like a one-woman orchestra. You know, she can do everything. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, I mean, she can be like a child sometimes. Sometimes we've used her like an English choir boy, you know, and then she does this kind of, you know, screaming banshee stuff that just sounds as come from, you know, some other side of hell that we don't even know of yet, you know, kind of sort of. She's like a plug-in. It's it's almost like yeah. when you switch between modes and you're just like, oh, I want this. Uh, and you're just like modulating. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. But that is the, th- but it, it's that combo that became the sound. Yeah. And to me, it's interesting how you're talking about getting into the emotional head of the viewer. And yeah. to me, writing, you know, this side of composing, I think of it as, just like how you write for songs too, because it's like when you write a song, like if somebody with just their guitar and vocal, they're trying to get into the head of the listener and connect with them. You're trying to connect what they're seeing on picture and to give a sonic representation of that emotion and to amplify it even more. Yeah. Writing a song and writing film music are, they are kind of slightly different things, but, and and that was the interesting thing, for both Ivor and I, was that I was having to come at it from her point of view, who was basically a singer-songwriter, and she was having to come at it from my point of view, in that she was, you know, instead of of reacting to, like, chords or, or feelings or something, I was making her react to picture yeah, as well. So she had to learn, she had to learn how to react to, to emotionally to picture and that was quite an interesting uh, you know exercise in itself and she got very very good at that and we had to kind of develop a language where i'd say i'd I'd kind of imply what kind of thing we needed here because you know you couldn't write down what i ever did there was absolutely no point in writing the music down you know why would you she you don't need her you know she's she she she's such a great improviser and how the hell yeah could you write half of it down anyway you know it's impossible. So not n- nothing. There was not a note of music was ever written down in the Last Kingdom. It was all performed. It was all performed yeah. basically both by me and Ivor. And then we had we had a couple of percussion sessions, and then and then in season three, I I badly needed an assistant. I needed a bit of technical help with all this stuff behind me so i got my assistant i got an assistant who was great actually and turned out and, and in fact um danny ended up doing you know a lot of season four and a lot of season five um and then and then he became a, he became a kind of colleague really so the and so the three of us ended up doing the you know the, the, the movie well when we came to do the soundtrack album that's when i realized that actually a lot of what Ivor and I had been doing was kind of like song material. So, and and also because she was an artist in her own right, we decided to, for the soundtrack album, not to take, you know, the cues exactly as they were in the show, but to actually take the material and, and really turn them into songs. And that's what we've done in the last two albums. So, the, the, so... On both the albums, you'll hear, there's stuff you'll hear that never appeared in the show. What I find brilliant is you said that she came at from an angle of like, oh, I have to learn this new skill of learning, you know, for TV and film and kind of invoking and understanding that. You came at it from like, I need to understand a little bit of hip. It, it, both of you were kind of stretched a little bit out of your comfort zone, but it produced something that was really amazing that worked well. And I think it's a testament to the idea of sometimes pulling yourself out of that comfort zone to see what can you do and what can you, how could you create this differently and how could this build a new skill set for you? Yeah, no, definitely. Definitely. That's good. Good for everybody all around. Yeah. I think. And funnily enough, I I think for Ivor herself, she, I, I made her confront her past in a way, you know, because she, she grew up as a kid singing this kind of stuff, you know, and then, yeah. um, you know, cause she's from the Fairwiles, although she now lives in Copenhagen. 
Um, but she was kind of trying to be a a, a pop artist, and, you know, and, and in some ways she probably still is. But now she her gig her live gigs she does music from the Last Kingdom now as well as part of it. So she's kind of re. I mean, it, it's a bit much for me to say that she, you know I helped her rediscover herself because she's more than capable of doing that herself. But I think it showed her that what you know she. She'd learned as, as as a kid growing up that kind of way of singing was actually incre- incredibly valuable in what she was doing herself. So she's kind of incorporated that back more into her her own her own music, really. And we have, yeah, we I mean we've become really good friends and and stayed really good friends actually. What I hear from that is it's almost again like co-writing. You just set the ground for her to. Uh, kind of live into that space and like, oh, this thing that I thought, like, I'm not going to do that much anymore. You, you helped re-engage that. You just presented the ground, uh, uh, that space for yeah. her to go there. And I think that's the sign of a good co-writer. Yeah. I mean, we did work incredibly well together. And he, in fact, he, and occasionally she would send me stuff that she just thought of, um, and which I'm really not used to doing. I'm really used to creating the groundwork and then yeah. maybe letting somebody else kind of I don't think I've ever before actually had the groundwork given to me and then for me to kind of uh embellish it on top and that was a quite an interesting you know feature uh, uh, as well from for it was a really really good learning exercise for me and also you know composing Composing can be, can be quite a solitary thing, actually. And although we ended up doing quite a lot of it remotely, you know, it's it's good having somebody to feed back off and you know and just ponder with. You know, I mean, it's 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 good. I, I do. You know, I I like collaborating. You know, this leads to the question: What got you into film and TV, especially composing? How did you get into this road? Because I know it's not a straightforward. Just oh, I just went on composing. I went down the door, you know, down the street, knocked on the door, and here I am. But like, it's a lot of twists and turns. Uh, well, I studied music at university, but then I came down to London. I got a publishing contract with a a pop music label in London. And that brought me down to London. And then for a while um, in my 20s, I was in two worlds. I was in the kind of classical contemporary world, and I was also in the pop world as well to kind of try and, and there, it was a bit of a clash. And then I was in this band that was quite famous in New- Britain and Europe in the 80s, and but we were quite experimental. And the music we were doing was quite complicated, so we didn't have much visually to look at, right? <laughs> in fact, there was one, the New Musical <laughs> Express. The New Musical Express once gave us a review. I, actually, they were raving about the music, but said we had the stage presence of a stepladder, <laughs> right? So, which was probably true, actually. And um, but so one of the things we did do is we got involved with contemporary dance companies. So we do, we do we kind of used that we'd write music, you know, with them, and we started doing these shows with contemporary dancers. And anyway, eventually the band split up, but um, I carried on working with the dance companies, and I did discover that I, f- I found I, I I did like writing music that had some kind of programmatic storyline element to it. And I found that I could do that, and, I, and, it, and it came quite naturally to me. Um, and then when I was about 31 or 32, you know, I was in London. There was lots of connections. I was working in not so much in media, but there was with the dance world, there was quite a lot of producers and directors kind of involved in theatre and stuff like that. And, 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 you know, I just, somebody asked me to do a, music for a tv series and they just fired somebody and you know could i step in at the last moment i i and i did and and as as soon as i did it i knew right okay that's it that's what i want to do Mm. i probably wasn't you know i was probably 31 or 32 but then i had had 10 years in london performing just about every style of 
music, you know, from jazz to pop to contemporary classical opera, you name it. Because that's kind of what you have to do, you know. You don't, you know, every, you know, I'm doing stuff from Downton Abbey to Last Kingdom, you know, within sometimes, you know, both at the same time. That g- switching, you know, the brain switching yeah. gears from being in that, you know, if you take things like Downton Abbey and things you've done like uh, Grandchester, Shetland, and then you move over to yeah. suddenly, boom, uh, you know, la- that is a huge shift to think of like, how are you going to pull these melodies or the the sound beds yeah. that you're creating? They're all vastly different. Yeah. In fact, I've just, I've just moved on from, we just finished Shetland about two weeks ago and I'm already on to Grandchester. Oh. So, oh okay. Um, yeah, on the new the new the new series of Shetland is really good. Yeah, you probably are not out. No, it's not. I, I we we're still waiting. Uh, my because when yeah. I interviewed you, I was like, I wanted to do a deeper dive, and I was like, oh Shetland. I was like, well, we'll, we'll watch. We binge the entire series. But I also loved some of the you know again the sound beds you create. I was like, because in my mind, I'm kind of like comparing them i'm like okay here's the doubt navi realm here's the last kingdom realm here's the shetland realm and i'm like okay it's just like there's a little organic but then i hear some like tension and release of and then some building of like synth pulses but then i hear drums and i hear some pulses again it's like you know that feels like a heartbeat to me this is a saint i can understand why you're like you have to be versed in many different you can't yeah. just if you're in one lane everything's going to lean towards this direction you've got to be able to pull from a couple different genres so that you can create those those different feels and those different scenes because yeah. the pacing's yeah. different in every diff, every show it's different yeah. yeah i guess my next question would be cuz well there's so many questions i want to get into but it's it's interesting that you say you had a pop background because part of me is like you know, I can hear some of that in the melodies. I can hear yeah. some of that yeah. in, but it's, it's done in a way that if you didn't say like, I had a pop background, somebody would be like, oh, okay. You just know how to write good melodies. But it's like, that has to help when you're coming into writing a hook or looking like, oh, here's my moment where I will have a melodic hook. That's very front and center. It needs like, when you hear it, you go, oh, it's this show. <laughs> like it's immediately yeah i mean definitely you know i mean like like the you know the theme for shetland's kind of like a song you know it's got yeah. those it's got those phrases you know that just that kind of answer one another really it is a bit like a song that one downton is slightly different i think in that you know all the elements kind of sort of mesh together they're kind of more like it's more like a modular thing really rather than a you know, a sort of song with accompaniment. Although, to be honest with you, Downton has got the veneer of classical music, but actually it's got the harmony of a pop. I mean, the, the, the title theme could be a Coldplay song. That's what's amazing about it. Yeah, you're you're very upfront about it. <laughs> yeah. You're, yeah, you know, it goes, you know, A minor, F major, A minor, F major, G major over F. An E, well, it's kind of like a... a, a it's got like, like a fourth chord on E and then it ends on a C major seven. That's it. I love that because I think that's a great testament to, you know, maybe people think like they try to overcomplicate things because they think overcomplicating will make it interesting. Not necessarily. Yes, right there. Has that always been your motto too when it comes to composing? I'm not sure that it's become my, my motto, but I, it's it's become obvious as I've worked in film, that that level of simplicity is what makes it work. Because you're competing with other things, you know, in film. You're competing with dialogue and visuals and sound effects as well. And all of those are contributing to the meaning that's going on as well. So you have to find your, you know, your own space within that and, and interact with it. And you can only really do that, you know, where the music's really obvious and really, really simple but that can take time you know people think you know that you know i mean downton abbey theme tune is incredibly simple you know it really is very simple but it took three weeks took me three weeks to write it you know so what you know does that make it simple or does that mean you know it's all white notes 
this just gets into me the the interesting realm of composing, whether you're doing it for film, TV, songwriting. It's it's all about connection. It's about enhance if you're writing a song. It's about working with your melody, your lyrics, enhancing the feeling. When you're writing for film and TV, it's enhance all those things that you talked about, the visuals, the dialogue, what is happening and finding your place in there to enhance all of that and not fight it and not deter or make somebody go like, I was paying attention, but what the hell are they doing here? Like it's like it's it's not gonna work yeah. then. But sometimes it is a while to get there because it's that balance. Sometimes simple can be the hardest thing to find because yeah. you'll want to yeah. overcomplicate it. But it's just I feel even when I'm mixing something or working on arrangement, it's always I'm eliminating things. I'm like taking things away because I'm like, oh, I take it away and I don't miss it. Like it wasn't adding anything other than yeah. me being like, oh, it's it's it needed to be there. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously when when you say simple, you know, you kind of, I mean, that can mean a multitude of things. Yeah, a lot of what I do is still, you know, very instinctual. I, you know, I I watch the 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 scene over and over again, and I I improvise to the scene, and I think one thing that makes a composer is that ability to when you have played something is to recognize that you've actually created something. You've, there's something in there that makes you go, Oh, what was that? What did I just do there? You know, and it's that ability to recognize that and then take it on board and, and develop it. I think that's what's, that's why I, you know, I do, I spend a lot of time improvising to the picture. I very rarely improvise away from, looking at the picture because I end up making it too complicated. You know, music just on its own to me, sometimes you can, you can overcomplicate things. So I'm, I'm constantly looking at the, the, the scene in front of me. I'm playing it over and backwards and forwards again. And sometimes I can spend days not getting anywhere, you know, and then suddenly some sparkle happen and then you just, but it's having that, ability, uh, experience always as well, of being able to hone in on what it was that that gave you that little spark. And that's kind of, that's what I'm looking for, you know, all the time, really. I've been doing a little bit of teaching, I mean, a tiny little bit, and I've been doing a, a little bit of mentoring, um, and which I have been found interesting because... It does confront what you do. You know, I think that what I do is kind of constantly in, instinctive, but actually, you know, there are reasons for a lot of it that I, that I just hadn't really explained to myself. And then when you're having to teach somebody about it, is you do you have to step back and think, right, okay, why, why have I done that? And oh, oh I see, that's why I do that. Um, but one thing with all my students, and it's difficult for them because usually there are time constraints on the things that we're going to do, but by and large, absolutely all of them are too happy to go with the first thing that comes into their head. Now, sometimes that can be right. I mean, occasionally, but not not enough of them. And then, and then what will happen is we'll spend quite a lot of time trying to mould that very initial material into something meaningful, you know, whereas... Actually, you know, the first idea really wasn't that good. The second idea wasn't really that good. You know, the third idea, um, mm, no, maybe not. The fourth idea, fuck, yeah, great. <laughs> that's you know, the thing. You know, that's, that's yeah. and then suddenly you're away. You don't spend all that time trying to mangle something that, you know, that wasn't there into something, you know, that me. So I, I'm... I'm I'm quite quite often will rip things up and start again. I love ripping things. I love just because mm. it I think it challenges you to it's like if you know we sat down and wrote a song it's just like okay that chorus isn't bad can we write a better chorus we probably can if we do it again. Cool. Let's push ourselves and write another chorus. We probably can write a better chorus. We probably it just pushes the realm of j just when you think there's something that that was pretty good there's probably something better if you do it again and repeat the process and re refine it a little bit and do it again, 
because you're right. It's hard to take something, maybe the first draft and try to make it meaningful when the whole point of the first draft was just to give you practice. It's kind of hard to make that uh, deep and like make it work when it's just like, oh, the point of that was just to give yourself some footing and just play around. And it is hard in a teaching sense as well, because you're kind of yeah. t- time constraints on on the students as well. Like when I first do a TV series, for instance, the first thing I'll look at is the schedule. And I always want, I want as much time in episode one as possible. Because if I get episode one right, then episodes two to ten are going to fall into place. You know, yeah. if I don't get episode one right, and it's a bit of a struggle time-wise, it's just going to lead, lead to problems further down the line. You know, so yeah. I I usually try and ask for like six weeks for the first episode, and then if the next ones are every two weeks, that'll be fine. You know, um, it's it's just making sure that your material is very is really strong. You know, and and if you look at Downton Abbey, all that most of the material, even to the movie, last movie, you know, much of the material was created in the very very first episode. And, and and it's the same with the Last Kingdom, you know. Most of the material comes from the very first episode. That to me is also insight in to how much thought you give to that because you're thinking long term yeah. when you think to that first episode because you're thinking this is going to paint the the story arc going forward. This is going to be the continual sound because it can't be something that just, you know, one minute sounds like this next episode is like, and then it's like, like, what the hell it changed dramatic. It's like, there has to be some, some consistency long-term with the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of what I'm doing is kind of unifying it and, 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 and Downton, a lot of the music's about the relationships between characters really rather than individual characters. But if you look at that opening theme, um, it's got like four main elements to it. It's got the dan 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 the main sort of solo piano tune. It's got this rising thing string tune da 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 di da 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 di da da which is much more sort of emotive and it's got this kind of very repetitive sort of piano da 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 and then there's this sort of more expansive chord uh, change at the end, which is much more kind of pompous. It's got like a dominant seventh, but in the fourth inversion. And those, all those four elements, they can work together as one, but each one of them on, on their own can be something else as well. So, for instance, you could you can do a really slow version of the da da di da di da da da. You can do it, you know, just on its own with you know different harmony underneath. In fact, I did do that as well. And then the rising string chain again with different under harmony underneath. You know, you can it's still it's still that tune, but it can take on an even more tragic. Meaning, you know, I, I ended up developing that tune for some of the more tragic moments, you know, in the TV series. It's all kind of interlocking like that. And so the materials kind of, especially in down to the materials, quite modular in that there's lots of different elements going on, but they can all be used separately or but they can also be used together as well. Hey, it's Mike, and I just wanted to jump in the middle of this episode, and if you're listening and you're getting excited about writing for TV and film, and you're like, hmm, I would love to do this, but how do I know what's working? What should I be writing? I'm so confused. It's all over the place. That's why you need to be a part of our Insider's Track membership. It's all about helping you understand what's working for TV and film so you can start writing the right type of songs, the songs that actually start working for TV and film, start working for the scene, so that when you see these opportunities pop up, submit this song for licensing, get to meet this supervisor, get to meet, get to meet, you don't have to question and wonder, are my songs working? You've put in the time and you've been a part of a community that helps you shape and craft the songs that do work for TV and film. So what I want you to do right now is go to insiders-track.com 
com or just click the link in our description and sign up. You're going to get, right now, listeners of this podcast are going to get a $100 discount for a full year's access to our membership. You can start joining our lives. You can start diving into past sessions, past guest sessions, and you can start joining for future guest sessions. So when all those opportunities pop up, guess what? You don't have to wonder. You don't have to question. You've got the songs ready. So remember, just go to insiders-track.com and start creating songs that work for TV and film. What I love is you were singing out parts. And for me, sometimes it's like when I know something feels right, I can kind of sing it out before I play it. Or if I'm playing something, I'm singing out the next thing. And I'm like, oh, that'd be cool. It's almost like they're, again, they intertwine, they work together, yet they're very strong independently. And that could yeah. be another version. And I just, yeah. I don't know. I just love the idea sometimes of like saying it before you play it to just like, you know, just, because it runs through your head and you can hear things. Uh, yeah. Well, when I'm improvising, you know, I'm not just playing the piano and stuff. I'm all, I'm also singing away to myself. I mean, God knows what it sounds, must sound like at times, but um, luckily nobody's usually listening to me. Anyway, <laughs> so it's fine. <laughs> that the, there should be a there should be an alternative version where it's just an album of you you just sing out the parts and that, and just blend them together. I think that to me saying before you play it is always just a great rule of thumb because we talked about this when you were with my class but like why I love things because when people look at me they assume like it's just nothing but punk rock that I listen to and I'm like no no it's just like but we talked about, I think the beauty of someone like a composer like Bach is I can sit there and I could sing you, uh, you know, sheep may safely graze. I could sing you the melody of, you know, sleepers awake. I could sing you, you know, minuet and she, because I'm like, damn, Bach was basically like a pop songwriter. Like he was a, like during that time, I'm like, he was a pop songwriter. He's writing all these melodies, counter melodies that just intertwine and they're so strong independently but how they weave together. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Chopin, definitely like that. Yeah. Chopin, I mean, Chopin was an improviser, basically. I mean, he's kind of, yeah, I mean, he's probably like a, he's, he was a pop musician of his own era, really. I think recognizing that, that, you know, it's like pop music isn't something that's, a, it's kind of slowly, it just looked different. We all, they just had wigs and they just, they had harpsichords yeah. and they had, and it was like, but that was like a modern day pop where everybody went. And I thought the power of their melodies are, there was no, there was no way that an audience could take that with them. They couldn't throw on their iPod. They couldn't throw on their phone. It was just the moment of being present and hearing their melody. But how yeah, many of them yeah. took away a moment? I mean, the amalgamation of you know people, things like you know Chopin and Wagner, but the amalgamation with black music, you know, yeah. or, or 100, 120 years ago. I mean, that's a massive change. You know, the, the, the last hundred and twenty years in music is all about the influence of black black music. You know, yeah. it's completely transformed it. It's completely kind of it's almost turned music on its head, basically. And you know that that combination has created a whole other, you know, amazing genre. Really, you know that. Yeah. I mean, it's extraordinary. I mean, I'm really. Um, I've always been a big fan of Duke Ellington, and I thought I knew his music really well. Um, but recently, I had a. I haven't. I looked. I was looking at a book, and it's just the. It's one of those. Um, you know, sheet music books where it's just a tune and there's a chord kind of chart underneath. And it's really made me think about what he does. I mean, the harmony is just so extraordinary. What, you know, doing that, you know, some of the stuff he did a hundred years ago. And it's really made me think about it. Really, really, I'm, I'm having to, I'm, I'm playing the tune with my right hand, but I'm having to think all the time about the harmony. I've learned so much. You know, and I'm in my 60s. I'm thinking to myself, why didn't I do this, you know, 40 years ago? You know, because it's an extraordinary learning experience. Now, something I just don't want to skip over that I think is awesome about that. And I think it's 
you're constantly looking for ways to just be amazed by music and just like take it oh, back yeah. a little bit and yeah, just oh, yeah. de deconstructing something or looking at it and being like, well, this is just changing the game of how I view things now. Like I'm, it's just another piece of knowledge where I feel like sometimes people think, oh, when you get a degree or if you just do this, that's where the learning ends. And I'm like, this is, it's actually just where it begins. Oh God, no. What you're describing oh, no. is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh no, God. Oh no, no, I, no. No, I'm constantly learning all the time. Yeah, I mean, even, you know, with all this electronic stuff at the back as well, I'm I'm constantly learning. You mean, I mean, music's an incredible thing, really, you know, when you think about it. And all the yeah. incredible stuff that people have done, you know, some of it written down, a lot of it not, not remotely written down, you know, I mean, it's extraordinary. I mean, to turn... I mean, like, you know, James Brown, that early funk stuff, to turn a dominant seventh into a tonic, yeah. you know, that's, you know, not even Wagner managed that. You know, that's <laughs> that's astonishing, really. You know, um, um, I mean, obviously, you know, as I get older, there's, there is a, it does, there is some, you know, styles of music that do take me a while to kind of, you know, broach and kind of, you know, get into and I, you know, that I don't spend much time, you know, I'm not in clubs all the time trying, trying to work out, you know, <laughs> yeah. what, but in fact, one of my wife's um, cousins from Australia came over and stayed with us for about two or three weeks and he's trying to be like a, a full-time DJ and um, mm -hmm. I've got no idea what that means, <laughs> you know, what does that mean? Yeah, it's <laughs> a completely different world. Record? Yeah. Do you just play records to people or I mean what some are a stretch, but it's interesting that yeah, it's just you're still looking for ways to just get inspired or things take you aback. And it's just oh, yeah. that is the power of music that it can make a connection that especially in this realm of composing, when someone hears it's it's an interesting question to ask, what's the feeling of this is leading to something that feels questionable? That no matter what language you may have, that chord or that sound that you're creating makes it feel like something's coming, or it's just like, oh, that 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 was a dodgy question. That was something that was weird. There's something beautiful about composing in that way. Yeah, it's. I mean, it constantly surprises me. Um, and I, you know, I've done so much now. I must have done over a hundred different, you know, projects. Um. Although I must admit, as I get older, the the pressure on because everybody wants a piece of genius for their show, and that's pretty pressurizing, you know, all the time. Um, and it, you know, eventually you can think, oh, you know, God, can I really have I really got the energy to do it? But there's something funny that happens when you. You put the episode up in the scene and you start to play with it and you think, Oh right, okay, all right, okay. And then so I'm kind of I'm kind of addicted to it. You know, I'll I'll miss it when I don't do it. That to me is also when you know you've kind of sparked there's a book I love, it's called uh The Big Leap and it's by Gay Hendricks, and he talks about the zone of genius. What's the thing that makes you feel like totally on fire? And what you're describing right there is like, you wonder like, oh, do I have it in me to just do it again? But then you start the process again. You go, oh, this is why I do it. It's almost like it takes you back to that first time that you composed and you were like, well, this is it. This is the thing that I'm doing because it's well, just, that's this the, is where. That's, yeah. yeah. Well, that's kind of part of the addiction is that, you know, there's incredible pressure to do it then. But then the payoff once you've done it, you know, is so massive and everybody, particularly, you know, within a film, because, you know, you're not entirely on your own. You are working with other yeah. people, and you are, and that is, you know, very much a collaboration with, you know, producer and director. And but w once you've done something that really works and really makes a difference to it, you know, everybody's really appreciative, and it's it's that kind of buzz that you get off it. I think that I would really miss that, despite that. Every time I come to a new project, thinking you know, oh my God, how am I going to bring this one off, you know, or, you know, this this is the one I'm going to be found out on, you know, kind of, you know, but because, you know, amazingly, I still have moments like that, you know, I still have days where I write complete rubbish, and that's, and that's hard, 
yeah. you know, to get to spend a couple of days, especially with some of the schedules we have now, you know, spending a couple of days and not having anything to show for it is 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 quite it's quite tough. There is an assumption where people think, well, oh, if you've done all this, now it's just you sit down and everything's gold. Like you're just like, yeah. but the idea of knowing like, oh, you've got several days where you feel like shit. This is nope, this isn't it. Yeah. And it's interesting because there's some people that get to that point in their writing, they're composing and they go, this isn't it. I guess I'm not meant to do. It. And then they leave. But there are others that go this shit. Well, I got to push through and eventually I'm going to get to where it needs to be. But there's just this weird, awkward moment of just like just the slow trudge to finding what is the thing as opposed to yeah. just bailing. And then it can be even harder after you've had something really successful. You know, everybody thinks, oh, well, you know, that, you know, they're expecting something, you know, along the same lines. And, and actually, without realizing just what hard work it was to come up with a, you know, with a first thing in, you know, in itself. I suppose what we're trying to say is, in the long run, is that although you might have might have had a, you know, a, 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 a serious degree of success in what we're trying to do, um, we're basically much still much in the same state as we were, you know, a student in our early 20s, you know, really, you know, it's still thinking, <laughs> yeah. oh, God, I mean, how am I going to do this? You know, I'm still, I'm really there, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not thinking, you know, I'm John Lunn, I've done Downton Abbey, this is, <laughs> this is going to be a doddle, you know, I mean, yeah. you know, it's not, it's not like that at all, you know, in some, some, in many ways, my, you know, my psychological well-being hasn't moved on in the last 40 years. Um, and then, you know, and that's maybe, that's pro possibly a good thing. You know, yeah. I, I think it's possible to get too, you know, too over yourself and to, and think that you really are a genius. And that actually, who was it said? I think it was a golfer, actually, <laughs> said, yeah the, the, yeah, the harder I practice, the luckier I get. But somebody accused him of being lucky or something. I can't okay. remember. The heart, and, he, and that's right. He said, the harder I practice, the luckier I get. Which I think is a great phrase because, you know, in, I, I don't think there's any luck involved in writing music, really. Would you say? Is there luck? Is there such a thing as luck? I don't think there's a, such a thing as luck. I think it's those that just stay with it, that are willing to be okay with the messiness yeah. of music at times. Because that's yeah. tough. It's it's a very uncomfortable yeah. thing to tell someone, like, you know, if I have a client or a student, I say, like, you're going to have to be okay with being uncomfortable for a while. It's not going to be good. Uh, like, I have hard drives full of just shit. Like, and yeah. I've never shown this and I'm never going to show this to anyone, Yeah, but I'm okay with no. that because you know, what's great. I look at that now and that was me learning and that was me performing at my best. That was me like really being like, this is good. And now I'm like, oh, that was, it was okay, but I stayed with it. And the only difference yeah. between someone doing it and not doing it is they just stayed with it. Yeah. I think that's the key. And or being a perpetual student, how you're saying, like, y still looking at someone else's work and being like, shit, that's amazing. And just like dissecting it and finding the gold and then just going back to their space and playing along. And just it's a new thing that's integrated to their process. Yeah, I think the I mean, the perpetual student thing, I think, is a bit of a problem because that, that sort of implies that you don't you know, you're always you're you're always working on something and you're not, but you know, at some point you're going to have to give birth to it and present yeah. it to the outside world. You know, I mean, and as you know, the sooner you do that, the better really. I mean, you can, you know, if you keep on thinking, because also I think that's also part of it because you can't, you can't just use yourself as a benchmark in music. I think, I think you have to use others as well. Is it so? What you think might be brilliant, you know, the rest of the world could completely hate. I mean, it's not rare if that happens, to be honest. But you know, it's entirely possible. So you do. So I'd I'd be wary of the perpetual student syndrome, you know, and yeah, and that, you know, I'm not going to release anything until I'm really, really happy with it. 
you know, I mean, I've kind of gone against what I said myself. You know, you should work on your material till you're till you're really, really happy with it. But so, but some somewhere in there, I'm kind of contradicting myself. But somewhere in there is is a kind of is a sort of truth. Is that you you are going to have to, you know, give it out to people to 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 hear. I think I grew up with a couple of people who I thought were really good musicians. And I would describe them as perpetual students. They never really placed their neck on the block, and they were always going to be—they were always full of potential, and they never ever realized it. I think we know a lot. I know lots of people that are in the same boat that are fantastic, but they've never stepped beyond. They've never taken that yeah. first step of. And maybe it's just like, you know, my, my skin has gotten stronger over time to just like, cool, give me the, give me the feedback of what is not working. It's, you know, I feel that's where I'm at now. I don't mind hearing when something's working. I'm like, that's great. But I'm kind of interested in what's not working. Like, where is yeah. the hole in this? There's got to be something. Cause it's like, it's not the best. Like, it's okay. How can it get better? Um, yeah. Because, yeah, you do want to work on it. And I agree. I think what you're saying is don't give the first thing, but by, you know, the 60th, 70th, 80th, you're no, you going to have to eventually, yeah. you're going to have to get it out there. <laughs> because if you get that feedback, you can then go back and adjust. And you yeah. can, and the next thing you create is basically the knowledge that you gain from releasing and learning from it. And you realize, well, if I do that again, I'll, I'll get better. And I'll get better as opposed to constantly revising it to it's perfect where it's not going to be perfect. It's just going to be, it's it, in fact, to make it worse because you're just, you may yeah. be taking some of the gold out of it that you don't know because you never took, never fully embraced actually showing someone it. No, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, and that can be hard, right? You know. It's tough. It's super tough. It's a very vulnerable feeling to to say yeah. to someone, "Tell me what's wrong." <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, did you have, especially growing, people that you kind of looked to that were doing the thing that you want to do that were able to kind of guide you along? I'm sure there's lots of people that you can think of that, but is there someone that stuck out to you that kind of guided you, especially during uh, as you developed in film? No, there wasn't really. Because I mean, you, in my, you, there was nowhere you could go and study it. I mean, now there are, you know, there are, there are there are hundreds of film courses all over the world now. No, there was nowhere. There's nobody. I guess I kind of, you know, I'd I'd probably been watching lots of movies and yeah. just taking it all in. But yeah, no, I did. I had to learn really quickly. That's amazing. Uh, but I love the fact that you're also, and this is a sign of someone that I think is not just a a great composer, but just like you're also taking that knowledge and helping others. Cause it's one thing to be applied to the things that you do, but to help other people understand and navigate, I think is huge. I, I, I do. I'm re I feel really strongly about that. Cause as I said, there was nowhere, you know, I could go to study really what I was meant to do. And, and, I, and, and film music's, you know, changing and it's changed over the years as well. And I think, and it's been good for me. I, you know, I learn why a lot by by doing a, a giving back. You know, but I'm getting mm -hmm. to the end of my career now, so I think it's important for me to impart my experience to you know the next generation. I think that's yeah. I think that's that's just what I should be doing. John, this was such a good conversation. I feel we could keep on going. It's like we haven't even gone into gear. Right. I'm, yeah. just like, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm just like I'm just like I. It's like we could go into analog synths and just how they're yeah. amazing. But you know, maybe we should do an analog synth one in six months' time. I think I think we need to do an analog synth one because I love. Uh, it, there's just something about it. we're in a world of plugins, which is amazing and wonderful. But there's something about being able to just like. I have off to the side, my little sturdy, trusty, like Moog to the side that has always been my go-to for when it's like making something interesting and just like to put my hand on like modulation and just like do filter sweeps. It's just, I don't know. There's something about it that's different than just. I mean, I, uh, I hardly, I, yeah, <laughs> I hardly use any plugins. I mean, it's mainly all, it's mainly all synths. Yeah, that's another. We got it. Yeah. That's a whole yeah. other episode. Well, you should do another one. <laughs> yeah, but uh, John, I really appreciate you taking the time.
Pleasure, Mike. And that does it for this week's episode. It was edited and produced by Chris Fafalius. And remember, if you're enjoying these episodes and you like the content that we're putting out, be sure to head to Apple Podcasts, leave us a five-star review, talk about your favorite episode, and then share. Share an episode with a friend because every little bit helps. Believe me, we wouldn't be here at 101 episodes without you. Until next week, I'm Mike Myers. Thanks for listening.